So on some recent overseas trips, we rented e-bikes to look around the destinations, and it really inspired us. The experience was an eye-opener. E-bikes are an ideal activity for people over 50. You can ride as long as you want without worrying about stamina. You can set the amount of power assist to get the level of exercise you want or to match your energy level at the time. Plus, it's an outdoor activity that gets you back out in nature. When we were riding e-bikes, we felt like kids again, gliding around town, seeing new things, with no worries about running out of energy. It was really fun. We realized that e-biking could be an ideal activity that could last us for years. We could find lots of new places to ride and not have to worry about the limits on terrain or distance that we would have with a normal bike. We could get bikes with a power range that could last us all day and give us hours of riding take full-day riding trips with a break for a lunch that we could carry in our cargo bag. It was a real game-changer for us. In this video, I'll go over some general e-bike features that people over 50 should look for when they're getting an e-bike and why they're important. You can use these tips to help find a bike that's right for you. And if you want to find out more about the e-bikes that we bought, check out the links in the video description. And there's some links to some more information about selecting e-bikes in general. And as always, if you like this kind of content, please take a moment to like this video and subscribe to our channel. And subscribe to our free newsletter that addresses issues of interest to people in their post-work years. The link's in the description. So we did some research to figure out what type of bike features would be important for people our age. We ended up finding an e-bike with all the features that we wanted at a reasonable price. We ended up buying two Velotric Discover 2 e-bikes for $16.99 each in June of 2024. That sounds a bit pricey, but it's a really great price point for a good e-bike. We were expecting the prices to be around $3,000 or more per bike. Finding something under $2,000 made a decision to purchase much easier for us. So this bike is an example of a high-quality, full-featured, mid-level e-bike. We'll go over the features that we think are helpful to people over 50, and you can use these types of issues to evaluate any similar e-bike from any company. These bikes come in two sizes, regular and large. We got two large bikes since we're large people. Kristen's 5'8", I'm 6'3". You can adjust the seat and handlebar positions to match your size. One reason we like this model is the step-through frame, which makes it much easier to get on and off and to steady yourself when you need to stop at a crossroad. You don't need to swing your leg over the back of the bike to get on and off. It's much easier than a bike with a crossbar. And this frame design, with handlebars that sweep back like this, allows you to sit upright, which is much more comfortable. This reduces the stress on your back that you would get from leaning forward, and reduces strain on your elbows because they're not carrying as much of your weight. And it's easier on your palms, since you aren't putting as much weight on them when riding. This particular model has wider, flat handlebar grips that also help distribute the weight over a wider surface, making it more comfortable. And since we're talking about comfort when riding, make sure that you get a bike with front shock absorbers. That's a must for a comfortable ride. We had previously rented e-bikes without shocks, and they were torture going over any bumps. We ended up standing on the pedals after riding a bit to smooth out the ride. The seats that come with this bike are fine, there's no need to upgrade for us. But since this bike model doesn't have rear shock absorbers, we added shock absorbing seat posts to smooth out the bumps, and that made a big difference. Shock absorbing seat posts are $30 or so on Amazon, or a bit more with the bike manufacturers, but they're totally worth it, and they're really simple to install. The E in e-bike stands for the electric motor assist system that helps you pedal a bike. There's a number of motor and battery issues to consider when selecting a bike. The motor power level will give you an idea of how much power you can call upon to drive the bike and to do more demanding assists, like providing power to climb up a hill. We recommend getting a bike that has at least 500 watts if you're going to ride in any area that has even small hills. 750 watts is better. This one has a 750 watt motor, so it works pretty well getting me up any hills. And once I lose some weight, it'll only get better. The type of motor on this bike is called a hub motor. It's located inside the rear hub. Another type of common e-bike motor is a mid-drive motor, which is located at the pedals and integrated into the bike frame. 
Mid-drive motors usually have a bit more torque and are more efficient, but they can require more maintenance, and they're more expensive. Hub motors are a bit less energy efficient, and they're a bit heavier, but they're less expensive, which makes the overall price of the bike a bit lower. Either type of motor will work fine for most uses. When you're evaluating bikes, look for a model with a torque sensor in the drive and control system. A torque sensor can sense how much physical force you're using to pedal, and it engages the electric motor assist to keep you at a constant rate of force. So the harder you pedal, the more assist is provided. So as you reach a hill and start pedaling harder to climb the hill, the assist will increase to maintain the same amount of pedal force as you climb the hill. Many of the lower-end e-bikes you may encounter will provide power when the system senses you're moving the pedals. This type of system is called a cadence assist system. It usually provides a constant amount of power based on the assist level you've selected when it senses that the pedals are being moved. A lower-end bike, like a city rental bike, often has just one level of assist. You'll find yourself moving the pedals just to keep the assist engaged. And that means you're not really getting any exercise, since your pedaling is not really doing anything to propel the bike. Battery capacity is also important. It defines how far you can go on a charge. Most bikes will give you an estimate about the range based on battery power. I assume those estimates are based on riding on a flat course with no headwind, so maybe you cut the stated amount by 30% or more to get a realistic range estimate. But the stated capacity is a good way to compare the utility of different bikes. This model states a range of 75 miles on a charge, which is pretty long. We haven't tested to that point yet, but we've been getting pretty good overall range so far. The batteries on this bike are removable, so you can take them off the bike and recharge them without having to have the bike in the same location as the plug-in charger. The charger uses standard current from a wall outlet. The bike batteries have a key lock that you open to remove the battery from the bike, so if you lock your bike outdoors, it's always a good idea to remove the battery to make the bike less attractive to thieves. One characteristic of this bike that was a selling point for us was that these bikes and the company were UL certified. We'd heard stories about e-bike batteries catching fire and about poor quality bikes coming out of China. So having a bike and company that was UL certified made us more comfortable making a purchase. These bikes and the batteries are also certified as generally waterproof, which is really important if you're going to be carrying them on a bike rack. No need to worry about protecting them from the rain. The better e-bikes have a number of pedal assist levels, allowing the rider to set the perfect amount of power to control the amount of effort they need to expend to ride, almost like setting the amount of weight on a weight machine in the gym. This particular bike has three general power modes, Eco, Trail, and Boost, with five levels in each, giving you 15 power levels. That makes it really easy to set just the right amount of boost for your ride. Look for a bike that provides a number of power levels so you can select a power level that adapts to your riding needs. The speed that you get using assist on these types of bikes is usually around 15 to 28 miles per hour. We usually do a pretty consistent 15 miles an hour or so on paved bike trails, and that's fine for us. 28's moving a bit too fast for the conditions we ride under, but it's nice to have a decent top speed when you want to go fast on a public street. This bike has a throttle that turns on the power to the motor without you having to pedal. On this bike, it's a small push lever. On others, it may be a motorcycle-style twist handle. A throttle is great to have for things like getting moving from a stop or when you're crossing a road. Just give it a nudge and the bike will move automatically. No need for any pedal energy to get it moving from a dead stop. One option to consider is what types of tires your bike comes with. Many bikes that are going to be used on gravel roads and trails have smaller, fatter tires to handle the rougher terrains. However, these bigger, fat tires may give you more resistance when riding on a standard roadway. We were mainly planning to use these on paved trails and roads, but we wanted something that would work on dirt roads too, so we got a bike with medium tires, about 4 inches, designed for paved roadways, but wide enough to give more stability than the thin road bike style tires. These tires have a real stable feel and can handle riding over slightly rough terrain. The brakes on these e-bikes are also really cool. This one has disc brakes on the front and rear, like a motorcycle. They work great, and they give you great stopping power without grabbing. Another cool feature that many e-bikes have is a walk assist mode that moves the bike along at around walking speed, 3 miles an hour or so, so you can be under power when you walk next to it, 
or you can use it as a low speed power assist to get the bike up a ramp next to a stairway. And e-bikes can come with a range of other features that are really nice to have. A headlight for riding after dark is usually standard. Brake lights and turn signals can come in handy if you ride on the road. This bike has a really nice display that shows the speed and amount of battery remaining and allows you to change settings. It also connects to a phone app via Bluetooth. This bike also has a built-in Apple Find My Device feature, like an AirTag. We, we hope we don't need that. Some bikes also have cruise control, which seems like a bit of overkill, but that's, that's kind of cool. And some bikes have a USB port to charge your devices from the bike battery. So we're really happy with our bikes, and we think they're a great investment in recreation and maintaining health. But there are a few downsides to consider. Cost is a downside. A good e-bike is going to cost at least $1,200, and it goes up from there to around $4,000 or so. We got these bikes for around $1,800, which seemed like a great value for a full-featured bike with a powerful motor and battery. We thought this model bike was the best value at the time we bought, which was June of 2024. One downside of these types of bikes is the weight. They're much heavier than regular bikes. These bikes are around 63 pounds. Most regular bikes are around 20 to 30 pounds. So these types of bikes can be hard to load on a bike rack or to get upstairs. If you're planning to use a car rack, make sure that you get a bike rack that's designed for the weight of e-bikes. Those types of racks are usually lower to the ground so you don't have to lift the bikes up as far and have supports for the wheels. This rack that we bought even came with a small ramp so you can roll your bike up onto the rack or you can buy a ramp separately. And these bikes are targets for thieves, so you have to avoid parking them outside for long periods or overnight. If you get an e-bike, get a good lock that's going to take a while to cut through with an angle grinder. A thief can get past any lock, but if you can slow them down with a lock that takes 10 minutes or more to cut through with a power tool, it can make a difference. Plan on spending at least $100 for a lock. We have some links to some good types of locks in the video description. We're planning to post some additional videos about our experience with these new bikes, and we'd love to hear your comments about your criteria for getting an e-bike and how it worked out for you. If you want to find out more about the e-bikes that we bought, or e-bike selection in general, use the links in the video description. And if you liked this video, please click on the like and subscribe buttons for this channel. And subscribe to our free newsletter that focuses on issues of interest to people in their midlife and beyond. Use the link in the description. Thanks for watching.